We're going to be continuing on with our, our study in the book of Acts. And so Acts chapter 9 is a pretty important chapter because we're going to start seeing a huge transition in the church, but also a huge transition in the life of one of the key figures in the other church. And of course, I'm talking about... Saul, that's right, Saul, and uh, I may refer to Saul as Paul. Uh, I realize it does not occur until Acts 13. Please forgive me, but it, it's just it's a habit. But uh, we're talking about the conversion of Saul this morning, which is going to be a wonderful study for us. And so let's go ahead and let's just jump right into the text. And let's look at uh, verses 1 through 9 of Acts chapter 9. Acts 9, verses 1 through 9. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for him letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do, or must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, neither ate nor he drank. And so what is Saul's mission as he's going to Damascus? What is his purpose? Persecute Christians. Persecute Christians, right. And how is he going to persecute those Christians? He's going to put them in prison, right? He's going to put them in prison, drag them back to Jerusalem. And if you go back and look at Acts 22, the conversion of Saul to Paul, well, not Saul to Paul, the conversion of Saul, who will later be called Paul, takes place three times in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 9, in Acts 22, and in Acts 26. And so in Acts 22, Paul says that he was going to take these individuals back to Jerusalem so that they could potentially be put to death. And so where does Saul get this authority from? The high priest, who's probably Caiaphas, probably the same high priest that was in power when Jesus was put on trial. He's probably the same one that stood there and listened uh, to uh, when James and John, I'm sorry, when uh, Peter and John were arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin. He would have been the one who would have presided over that incident. He would have been the one when all 12 were brought back before the Sanhedrin. He would have been the one where Stephen was. And of course, remember what happened to Stephen. They drug him out and stoned him to death. Now, while we were talking about Acts chapter 7 and 6 and the relationship about what happened with Stephen, I suggested it was my opinion there was a close relationship between Stephen and I remember I don't think of a relationship as like buddy buddy but like Saul, right? Because I talked about how Saul was a Hellenist, right? From Cilicia, from Tarsus. Stephen goes to a synagogue of Hellenists who Saul is. We know Saul's in Jerusalem in this area. And he goes to the synagogue where there are a lot of Cilicians. And he gets in an argument. And somebody goes and tells the high priest what's going on. And then later we find out that Saul was there uh, consenting to his death. Later we find out that Saul was a under the training of the rabbi Gamaliel, who was a member of the Sanhedrin, which would have put Saul in close circles with the high priest. And now in Acts 9 we're told that Saul goes to the high priest, Caiaphas, to get orders to go to Damascus to bring Christians back. And so I think it even strengthens the idea of Saul being very familiar in the inner circle with guys like Gamaliel and with uh, Caiaphas, the high priest, and his working with um, to get Stephen to be brought on trial. Which is interesting because if you look at Acts 22, Jesus adds something else in that passage. It says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? There's another phrase that Jesus adds in Acts 22. Does anybody know what that phrase is? Anybody? Why do you kick against the goads, right? Sharpen sticks for oxen. And so Jesus says this like, like Saul has questions in his mind. I mean, this, when, when Saul sees Jesus on the road to Damascus, this is not the first time he's thought about Jesus and the Old Testament prophecies and whether or not this guy truly was the Messiah or not. Jesus says, why are you kicking against the goads? Why are you fighting this? And so, you know, I, I think about, you know, maybe Saul was 
you know, ref, you know, fighting with Stephen, who was inspired by the Holy Spirit, who was who was winning the argument. You know, maybe, maybe he was. He was probably there when Stephen was preaching that sermon in Acts seven to the Sanhedrin, and he was hearing the words that Stephen was saying. Of course, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so he's hearing these things. He's going to Damascus, and Jesus says, "Why are you kicking against the goats? Why are you fighting this?" You know, and so I think it's just a it's, it's a really interesting thing. And so he heads to Damascus, which is about 140 miles northeast of Jerusalem. It would have taken about seven days, maybe a little bit longer, to get to Damascus. It's, it's a pretty good trip, especially in the ancient world. And so he goes there, and he sees and hears Jesus. Uh, also, we're told that uh, there was a very, very large um, Jewish population in Damascus. There were the second most populated area for Jews outside of Palestine was Syria. Um, and that was true for a long time up until recently. And so we're told there were thousands of Jews in Damascus. In fact, Josephus tells us that Nero, which would have been about 20 years after this, uh, killed thousands of Jews in the city of Damascus itself. And so this would have been a hotbed for Jewish synagogues. This would have been a, 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 one of the first places that Christians would have fled to. And so Saul was going there to talk about this. He sees Jesus. Uh, it's interesting that the apostle to the Gentiles would receive his call while being outside of Israel. And so I think there's quite an interesting nuance there. And the light is often associated with the presence of God. Uh, Paul even mentions this in 2 Corinthians 3.8 and 2 Corinthians 4.6. And so, uh, did Saul persecute Jesus personally? We know Jesus was persecuted, but was he persecuted by Saul? Like on the cross during his last days? During Passion? No, he, he probably didn't. But Jesus says here, why are you persecuting me? And so why is that interesting or important? He's preferring the church, isn't he? Yeah, and so it shows the connection that Jesus has with the church and with Christians. And so oftentimes we feel like, you know, oftentimes we feel like we're going through a, a, a tough, difficult time. We feel like God isn't near. We feel like He's far away. We feel like He doesn't care. He's not interested. And yet here these Christians are being persecuted, and Jesus takes it as personally as you can. He says, why are you persecuting me? And so I think it's interesting here this idea that Jesus identifies with His people in the persecution that they're going through. And so he's struck blind. He's led to Damascus. He doesn't eat or drink for three days. He fasts. And while he's fasting, he's praying and he's receiving visions. Verse 11 talks about one of those visions he receives of Ananias coming and laying his hands on him that he might regain his sight. And so here we have this, this very crucial point in the days of, uh, of Saul. And so do we have any questions or comments on verses 1 through 9? Do you think the Lord... James, you first, and then Miss Susan. Well, I think, well, you know, uh, Christ identifies with His people. Um, and so I think the idea that we are in Christ and we find our identity in Christ, Christ also has an identity with us. And so um, I think that, I think, you know, it's kind of like your wife. Like if somebody insulted Miss Faye. Right. They didn't insult you, but you would take it personally, right? Well, the church is the bride of Christ, and of course us Christians make up that, that bride. And so, you know, it's kind of like if somebody was to insult Miss Faye or Brittany, we would take it personally. I think, I think Christ takes it personally when people persecute Christians or persecute the church um, that He purchased with His own blood, His, his bride, if you will. And so I think it is a, a personal thing. Uh, Miss Susan? Scriptures. And I wonder if uh, the Lord wanted uh, Saul and Paul on his side because he was such a zealous worker about what he was doing. Not only eliminating Christians, mm -hmm. but then when the Lord turned him over to where he gained the Christians. Well, I think, he, I think he is. I think the Bible does tell us, Miss Susan, because it talks about how he's a chosen instrument. And it talks about him being a chosen instrument. We'll talk about that in the next passage, but I think you're right. I think you're on to something there. Great, great comments. Anybody else with a comment or a question? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think that's part of the picture also. Great. Yeah. We need him in the church. 
Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great point that he was zealous, right? Even Paul would talk about how he, you know, he, he was zealous when he was persecuting Christians. I think it's in Acts 22 when he talks about his conversion story that he mentions that. And even in Romans chapter, uh, I believe it's 9, maybe 10, where he says, you know, the, the Jews have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. You know, this idea that you can be zealous for God and still be lost. You know, you can be zealous and sincere and still not know what you're doing or know what's right. And uh, it's important for us to see people who are zealous for God, just like Paul was. I mean, we could look at Paul and said, you know, he's, he's a bad person. He's the one who is responsible, potentially, I don't know, for turning Stephen over to the Sanhedrin. He held his coats while he was being crucified. He's going to Damascus. But at the same time, you can say, man, he's, he's really convicted religiously. Like, he's very zealous. Paul's the type of person, Saul, if you will, where he thinks he's doing this, because he believes the old law. I mean, if you're a blasphemer under the old law, you should be put to death. I mean, Saul's not making up the rules. He's following the rules. And so, I think the takeaway for us today is, there's lots of people who are not Christians who are zealous for God. Who truly think that they are doing what's right. And who are doing that because they think it's right. Now for us, we can look at those people and say, oh, those poor pitiful idiots. You know, they're so ignorant, they don't know what's going on. Or we can say, they're so zealous to please God. I think if I showed that person from the Bible what the New Testament says we're supposed to do to please God, I think they do it. And, uh, and so I think there's a lot of Pauls out there that need to be in the church today that we can see and look at. Um, and, and many of us have had Bible studies where somebody wasn't a Christian and were very convicted, very strongly convicted about what they believed. But as soon as they saw it in the Scriptures, they thought, well, if it says it, I'll do it. You know, and I think Paul kind of matches up with that. Uh, Brother James? I, just, I thought it was a little interesting. Uh, Isaac, uh, in the uh, account we're reading now, chapter 9, he's talking about the Jews being Yeah. 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 It's very interesting. It's very interesting to look at chapter nine and chapter twenty-two. Of course, we'll get to chapter twenty-two. But one of the things interesting, if you look at chapter nine, things that critics have said in chapter nine, they hear. Chapter twenty-two, they don't hear. And so many will say, "Well, look in in, in Luke's account in Acts nine, the people, you know, they they hear." But if you go to Paul's account, they don't hear the voice. Or do I have that backwards? Which one is it? In, the, in, in, in uh, chapter 22, I think Paul said, those who were with me, uh, they did not hear the voice of the Lord. Yeah. Yeah, and so and people have looked at that and said, look, in Acts 9, Luke's account, he, they hear the voice. Acts 22, they don't hear the voice. It's pretty clear in English, this is a contradiction, but it's not. The problem is, if you look at it is in the Greek, which I understand people hate that. I get it, okay? But they have different cases. And so in Acts chapter 9, the word for hearing there, the phone, is the noise. And so they hear the noise, but they don't hear the actual words being spoken. And then in the Acts 22, it's in the accusative, which is like the substance of the, of the sound itself. And so like, it's not saying that they heard, they heard the voice in Acts 9, they didn't hear it in 22. They're saying in Acts 9, they're saying they heard the sound. Acts 22 says they didn't hear the voice of Jesus. Does that make sense? Hear a sound, but don't perceive it to be the voice of Jesus. So that's, that's another Acts 9, Acts 22 um, correlation that's interesting. Good. Uh, Brother Ed, you had your hand up too. Uh, I, think it's, I think that's one reason it's hard to convert people out of the world is that uh, I know when we were growing up, we went to the Presbyterian Church. And the Methodists and Presbyterian, they'd have fellowships maybe once a month or four yeah. together. And yeah. you know, one was as good as the other. But in the church, you stand alone as one body that, of believers. Yeah. It's a little more difficult than to teach those out there in the world. Yeah. 
It does. It does put up a barrier, if you will. Um, but uh, that's just one of those things that, you know, that is difficult, you know, because I think so many times that uh, we are perceived to be so different from the outside world, which we are. I mean, I'm saying we shouldn't be different, but it's almost people are afraid to talk to us. You know what I'm saying? Um, I had somebody come and knock on my door one time and uh, they were talking to me and, I, and uh, they were inviting me to the church they were starting. And I smiled and I was, I was wanting to talk to him. I said, well, actually, I'm the preacher over at the Madison County Church of Christ. And like, have a great day. <laughs> like, he was done. Like, he was just, he was done. You know, and uh, if I'd have said I was a preacher in a denominational church, he may have stayed in chit-chat. I have no idea. You know, asked to have a, you know, go in together on the coat drive or something. I don't know. But um, when he heard that, he was just, he was done. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. So, I don't know. Um, if if you want to be popular, I guess you could say you don't have to believe in anything. Uh, but if you take a stand for something, a lot of times people don't like that. And so that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. 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 There's a there's a set there's this idea of clergy laity where um, you know there's the preacher is more responsible uh, and we're told in James that teachers and preachers will be responsible for all they say and it says that we'll have the greater condemnation and the greater judgment if you will um, but at the same time we're all responsible like you're saying for what the Bible says we all have that responsibility uh, getting to judgment and shrugging our shoulders and say well my preacher or pastor or whoever you know my mama told me this and it's just not it's not a valid excuse on day of judgment no. good good questions let's go ahead and let's look at verses uh, 10 through 19 Oh, here, if you will, before we do that, here's a picture of Jerusalem and uh, Damascus, which is over in Syria. And so you can kind of see this is about a 140-mile trip. Uh, pretty, pretty good-sized trip would take about a week. Which, when you think about it, I can get on a plane, and it might take me... India is about as, like, literally the opposite side of the world. Like, if you look, we're in the northern hemisphere, they're in the southern hemisphere, we're in the western hemisphere, they're the eastern. India, Saha, is about as far as away you can get from us, from anywhere else in the world. Saha can be here in about a day and a half of travel, you know, if things go smoothly. Two days, 48 hours, if it goes unsmoothly. You can fly to the other, other end of the earth and back in three to four days. It took them seven days to get to Damascus. This is kind of interesting to think about it. Yes, Ken? Uh, Damascus there, uh, you know, that's where they're having all this war and stuff, and there's Christians being persecuted there. Yeah. The descendants from these Christians, you know, we're talking about now. Could it be the what? The descendants from these Christians. Uh, it could be, uh, depending on migration patterns and stuff like that. Um, it could be, unless we took a ancestry, you know, 23andMe, we'd probably be able to tell. But, but, but it is the same area. And in fact, where is Paul staying? I'm going to see how well you know. We haven't we haven't discussed this yet. Paul was staying at a street called Straight. That street uh, was laid out during the Hellenistic time frame probably about 100 years, 200 years before Paul gets there, that straight, that road is still there today. And so you can actually go to the street called Straight. It's not called Straight because that's an English word. Um, but you can look it up. I, I saw the, the Arabic name for it um, just, uh, just yesterday. And, uh, but you can actually go to the street called Straight in, in Damascus today. Now, it is war-torn, and you probably don't want to go to Damascus today, but uh, it is there. Um, so let's look at verses 10 through 19. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and a man in the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen a vision of a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him, that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has the authority and the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. 
But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered into the house, and laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight, and he arose and was baptized, taking food, he was strengthened. And so here, Ananias is told to go to Saul. Now, Ananias is described in Acts 22, verse 12, by Paul. And Paul says Ananias was a devout man according to the law. So he was a very good Jew who was a Christian. And he was well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there. And of course, we see that Ananias is afraid. And so apparently, uh, Saul's reputation uh, uh, went ahead of him. And so it took a vision from the Lord. And when he first received the vision, was he ready to go? No. He said, Lord, you know, this guy's bad news. I mean, this is a pretty rough guy. And uh, what, what does God say the reason why he's going to go? Why he wants him to go and talk to Saul? Well, he's going to have to suffer. But he says, I want you to go because he is a chosen instrument of mine. And so it's interesting here that Paul came to Damascus to imprison those who call on God's name. Now, this passage, this, this phrase, call him the Lord, we talked about this in Acts 2, is a quotation from Joel 2. And this has been taken to mean something today that it was not written to mean in the first century. It does not mean the sinner's prayer, or it does not even refer to prayer at all. But this actually has very strong baptismal reference. Every time you see this, this call on the name of the Lord, it's always uh, connected to baptism in Acts 2, when Peter says that, you know, he quotes Joel 2 and says, you know, the day is coming where God's going to pour out His Spirit on those who call upon His name. And they end the sermon and they say, men and brethren, what shall we do? What does Peter tell them? Repent, be baptized. And Joel 2, it says, I'm going to pour out my Spirit on those who call on my name. When do they get the Holy Spirit in Acts 2? When they're baptized. Right? Acts chapter 9, he says he's coming to, to put in prison all those who call upon the name. Then we see Paul himself call upon him, Lord. How? With a prayer? No. How is he? Go to Acts 22:16. Right? And then I says, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so this idea of calling the name that is often used by denominational people today to refer to the sinner's prayer or by saying a prayer, is, is, even if you look at the context of Acts 9, I mean, they'll say, if you just say a 15-second prayer and accept Jesus into your heart, you'll be saved. You'll be a Christian and your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay? Paul was a chosen instrument of God. Chosen by hand, right? He saw Jesus with his own eyes so he could be qualified to be an apostle. Why did I say that? To be an apostle, you had to be a witness of what? The bodily resurrection. Paul couldn't be an apostle unless he saw the risen Lord, which he did in Acts 9, which qualifies him to be an apostle. So in Acts 9, you have Paul, Saul, who sees Jesus, who confesses him as Lord, if you go with a denominational excuse, you know, Lord, Lord. He goes to Damascus. He prays and fasts for three days. So Paul, the chosen instrument of the Lord, didn't eat, drink, and prayed for three days. And when Ananias got there in Acts twenty two sixteen, we know he still had his sins. And so the whole idea today of the sinner's prayer, praying to have your sins removed, there's nobody in the Bible that's not baptized that prays to receive the forgiveness of their sins. Nobody. The only people are those who have already been baptized, like in Acts 8 with Simon the Sorcerer. Brother Ed. I had a denominational person one time we studied with, or I was serving with, that uh, said, he called him Brother Saul. He was already his brother. And, uh, yeah. Back in that day, the Jews called, you know, each other. Yeah, yeah. That, that has been an argument that has been used, and it's a, it's a terrible argument. It's an awful argument. And, um, and I, I hate to be mean, because I don't want to be mean. But there's just been a lot of bad arguments that get regurgitated through the time. He calls him Brother Saul because he's a Jew. And that's how they refer to each other, was Jews. It's a term that's adopted by the early church. When Paul gets up in Jerusalem and addresses the Jewish crowd, 
they're not Christians. Paul's given a defense of why he is a Christian and his conversion story to these to the Jews who aren't Christians. And what does he call them? Brothers. He says, fathers and brothers. Right? Because they're Jews. They're ethnic Jews. And so, great point. That's just a really good point. But yeah, no, he was not a Christian at that point. Yes, Tim. In Paul's conversion, could you say that did he receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Did, could you say that? Did, you, could you, did he receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit when he was converted? I don't, I, I don't think so. It, Ananias comes and lays his hands on him and it says that scales fell from his eyes. And so in the vision in verse 11, he sees Ananias come and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. The Holy Spirit's not listed in, in verse 11 in Saul's vision. And then we see him lay his hands on him. He receives his sight. And then um, he's baptized later. And so it doesn't, there's, there's not a real, there's not a definitive term we can see either in Acts 9 or in Acts 22 when Saul received the Holy Spirit or if he received the Holy Spirit before he was baptized. And so it's a good question. And the simple answer is, I don't know. Um, now we see it in the next chapter in Acts 10 with Cornelius and his household. Um, but it's a good question. Now we do know he received an apostolic measure of the Holy Spirit, but as far as the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I don't know. It's a good question though. I'm interested in, at least right now off the top of my head, I'm thinking of all of Cornelius converted differently than everyone else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, think from being an act, act of opposition to God, and picked and chosen and intervened in divinely to cause him to become a Christian. And then Cornelius to become the first Gentile. They, Peter was sent for and, you know, miraculously sent to him. Yeah. You know, the Holy Spirit fell on before they were baptized and all that. So yeah. It's interesting. Well, not just those. You could even go back and say in Acts 8 with the Ethiopian eunuch, right? Because even because Philip is sent. You know, the Spirit tells Philip to go. Ethiopian eunuch is, is unknown. He doesn't know what's going on at that point. And so I think, I think what you're saying is great. But I think, you can, I think you can line up and say Acts 8, the Spirit sends Philip to the eunuch. Acts 9, Paul sees, Saul sees Jesus. Ananias is sent to Saul. Acts 10, you've got Peter is sent to Cornelius. And so all these things happen. And so you see the Spirit say people, but do any of these, at any point does the Spirit ever tell any of these men how to become a Christian, how to be saved? Or how, how, how their sins washed away? It's always to earth. We talked about that last week, right? And it's amazing how these guys are sent. But every time, it's the human agent that is teaching them what the Word is. And so, yeah, it is, it is interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's hard. And so there's a plot twist. He goes to arrest people who have called on the name, and then he winds up calling the name in baptism himself. Paul was a chosen instrument. Many have asked, why was Paul a chosen instrument? Because Paul was a Gentile to the Gentiles. But he was a Jew. But he was a Hellenist Jew. Now, he would say he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. And so you have this guy who could stand up there and say, look, I was, a, I was a student under Gamaliel. And back in the old days, you didn't get to be somebody's student because of money you paid. They would actually, you had to have a test to become a rabbi's disciple in the first century. And so the better, the higher status rabbi, the smarter you had to be to be his disciple. Gamaliel was one of the top rabbis in the first century. Paul's his disciple. He's a very brilliant guy. He says, I was a Hebrew of Hebrew. You know, I was a, you know, I was a Pharisee, trained in the feet of Gamaliel. And so you got this guy who knows the old law, but he also understands Greek customs. And so you have this guy who can bridge this gap in the early church between Jews and Gentiles. And so, and that's why the very next chapter, what do we see? The gospel being opened up to the Gentiles. 
And the first Gentile congregation is in Antioch. And who gets sent to Antioch? Barnabas. And who does Barnabas say, get over here and start working with me? Saul. It all works together. It all fits. And uh, so it's interesting. So Saul is, is baptized, um, and he can break from his fast and now rejoice. And so Saul has to flee twice. So let's look at verses 20 through 31. 20 through 31. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem and on those who called upon the name? And he has not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. And when many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day by night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him and by night and let him down through the opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when they had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took and brought him to the apostles, and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among those in Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him to the town of Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. And we can read verse 31 if we like. The church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had, had peace and was being built up, walking in the fear of the Lord, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit had multiplied. And so here we see... Saul has to flee Damascus, and so the antagonist has become the apologist. The persecuted has be, the persecutor has become the persecuted, and so we see this transformation take place in in Saul. And so he immediately goes from condemning Christ to preaching that he's Lord, trying to convert people, and so he preaches in Damascus. Then he leaves. The text says for many days. Now, Galatians chapter 1 is one of the best passages that gives us an outline of, of Saul's early life after conversion. Now, this many days that we see here in this passage, in Galatians 1.15, Paul tells us it's three years. So Paul preaches in Damascus. He goes out to the Arabian desert for three years. He goes back to Damascus and continues to preach. There he makes the Jews mad, and they're going to kill him. Now, Galatians also tells us, also with 2 Corinthians chapter 11, that the, Neb the Nabataean king, who was an Arabic king, was also in on the idea to try to kill uh, Paul, or Saul at this point. And the king ruled from 9 to 40 AD, so we can kind of book in about when this took place. Many have suggested that Paul was converted somewhere between 36 and 39 AD which would have been about uh, 10 years after the church is established, depending on how you date when the church was established or when Jesus was born. And so they, he goes to Jerusalem. Um, the disciples are afraid of him. It's been three years since he's been in Jerusalem, but they still remember Saul and what he did and the things that he said and the people that he had arrested and those whom he had killed. And so they're very afraid of him, but he finally gets Barnabas to speak up for him and take him to the apostles. Now in Galatians, uh, Paul would say it was only Peter and James, those who he talked to. But Peter extends the, hand, the handship of fellowship with him, the hand of fellowship. He stays with Peter for about two weeks. He's trying to preach and teach. Who starts fighting with Saul? He's preaching and there's a group of people who get real mad at Saul start getting mad at him. Who are they? The Hellenists. Who did Stephen preach at that got real mad that sent him to the high priest? The Hellenists. And so, once again, this is just Isaac's opinion. This is not biblical. But man, wouldn't it be funny if three years earlier Saul was there in, with the Hellenists fighting against Stephen and three years have passed and now Saul is fighting against the Hellenists? I don't know, it's interesting. But anyways, in Acts 22, Paul says that he goes to the temple to pray. And there he receives a vision where the Lord tells him, get out of Jerusalem. And so he goes and he flees and he goes back home to Tarsus. And so now his old friends have become his enemies. And his enemies have now become his friends. And so um, 
after, like I said, after two weeks, he goes back to home, and he goes to his hometown of Tarsus, and he preaches there until he's called by Barnabas. Here you can see the travels of Paul, Saul. You can see he goes from Jerusalem up to Damascus, Damascus down back to Jerusalem, and then he goes to, to uh, Caesarea, and there he takes a boat to Tarsus, where he's going to stay until it's time to go over to Antioch uh, to, to preach. And so that is all the time. We're not going to have time to finish out the chapter, but don't worry. The, the, the end of chapter 9 actually sets up chapter 10 very nicely. And so uh, we'll look at that next week. But some important takeaways that I think uh, people can change. Um, we need to be able to see people who are zealous for God. Because there's, there's a lot of people who are zealous for the Lord, but unfortunately are ignorant. I mean, that's exactly what Paul said in the book of Romans. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And if we can take those people... Some people, you'll show them what the Bible says, and they'll, they'll get offended and mad and storm off and say, I ain't doing that. But there are lots of people who genuinely want to please God that if you show them what the Bible says, they'll listen and they'll convert. But if we never try to figure out who those people are and share that message with them, then who knows um, if they'll ever come in contact with it. Uh, conversion happens at baptism. Uh, Paul saw, saw the Lord prayed for three days, fasted, um, recognized Jesus as Son of God, he still had his sins, Acts 22, 16, until he was immersed in water. The importance of teaching, just like uh, Steve was talking about. Um, we can look at Acts 8, we can look at Acts 9, look at Acts 10, and all these times the Spirit is sending somebody to preach the message. But the Spirit never tells these individuals what they've got to do to be saved. It is always somebody who is teaching and preaching. Now, we have the Spirit today, right? And the Spirit today is still telling us to go and teach the message. And still providing the message. But just like in the first century, somebody had to say something. 2,000 years, nothing has changed. We, we have the Spirit's message to go, and we have what it has to say. But if we don't teach it and preach it, the Holy Spirit's not going to come to somebody and tell them they got to be saved. It's, that's our job, just like it was the job of men and women in the first century. And then, of course, new family and new friends. Um, we stayed here at the building uh, this past Sunday night. No, Saturday night. Friday night. I don't even know what day it was. Okay. Uh, we stayed to 11 o'clock. We got here at 6. We had a young professional's um, holiday party, and we stayed to 11. Of course, Brittany's pregnant, worked all week. We've been somewhere every night, and she's tired. And she's like... Do we have to stay to 11 o'clock? <laughs> and I said, I know, but, you know, you guys, if you're from here, you have family. And when we're in Georgia, we go to her grandparents' house, her aunt and uncle's house, and we'll sit and we'll talk and we'll eat food and we'll look up and we'll leave. It's 1030 at night. Well, I don't live with my family. You guys are my family. And so uh, we were talking about that, how that is, that is my, you know, getting to sit around and chit-chat and eat till 11 o'clock. I mean, this, this is what I have. When you become a Christian, you have new friends, you have new family. And really that family group and friend group expands and enriches our lives. And so even though uh, Saul went back to Jerusalem with a different friend list, a different enemy list, um, he can see the benefits of being in Christ. Any questions or comments before we uh, dismiss? No? All right. Well, thank you so much for your attendance and for your questions and comments. And next week we'll pick back up with the end of chapter 9 and chapter 10. Let's go ahead and end with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your word and for the blessing it is to our lives. We're so thankful for the conversion stories and acts that we can be able to see how these men and women were converted in the first century uh, through the teaching of the Holy Spirit by men who were inspired and to be able to have the confidence and assurance that our conversion stories match up with theirs, uh, that just like them, that we have confessed you before men, repented of our sins, and been immersed in water for the remission of those sins. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the assurance that we can have in Christ Jesus through your word and through his teaching and help us to find individuals like the Apostle Paul, people who are zealous for you but perhaps maybe not according to knowledge and help us to open up our mouths and share with them the good news that they might have a knowledge of what your word says and how they too can have a relationship with you through Jesus Christ. Please be with us and help us to do all things in a way that pleases you. Here's the name we pray. Amen.